Hello, friends. Today we are looking into Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 13 in this video. There really is no break between chapters 14 and 15. Paul is carrying on his treatment of the strong and the weak. He is likely continuing to speak to Jewish and Gentile Christians, factions in the church at Rome. But in this section, beginning in chapter 15, he puts somewhat more stress, I believe, on the importance of unity among Christians. And that must have been a problem in the church at Rome, disunity. Notice verse 5 of chapter 15. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's interest is that Christians live in harmony with one another. I want you to notice, too, that in verse 5, there, there is purpose in Christian unity. Paul says, I want you to live this way in order that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The unity of brothers and sisters in Christ glorifies God. It praises God. And that's the purpose of Christian unity, at least one of the purposes. Now, how is that unity produced? I know the Holy Spirit certainly produces unity in God's people, but we, of course, must pursue that. We must make every effort to pursue that unity, right? That's Ephesians chapter 4, isn't it? I think Paul gives us several answers to that question, how is unity produced in chapter 15? Well, it is produced, first of all, verse 1, when the strong put up with the failings of the weak. When consideration for weaker Christians takes precedence over what we ourselves would like to do, Christian unity is possible. Well, selfishness is always a barrier to Christian unity, isn't it? So we need to discard all selfishness in our dealings with one another. Secondly, I think Paul is telling us that Christian unity is produced when we follow the example of Jesus. He set the interests of others before his own. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. That's verse 3. Now that's a statement from Psalm 69 and verse 9. So interestingly, when Paul states in verse 4 that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, he is referring to the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures were not written alone, therefore, for the benefit of those who lived then, but also they were written for us. It's important then that we Christians, that we Christians study the Old Testament. I think there's a third reason, uh, or at least a third way that we produce Christian unity in this text. A Christian unity is produced when we accept one another as Christ has accepted us. That's verse 7. Paul just had to add that last phrase, didn't he? Just as Christ has accepted us. He's reminding us that we have been accepted by Jesus. So, just as Christ has accepted us, we are to accept other believers. When Christ has accepted someone, who are we to say that we will not take him as a Christian brother or sister? And again, what is the purpose of this mutual acceptance? Paul says it is for the glory of God. Verse 7, God's glory is promoted when Christ received us sinners, and it is further advanced when we ourselves receive our brothers and sisters in Christ with warmth and love. Now, I like verses 8 and 9. I think Paul, in those two verses, states one last time uh, that Christ is part of the plan of God. He is one last time informing his readers that it was indeed God's plan that Christ would become a servant of the circumcised, that is the Jews, by fulfilling the promises that God made to the patriarchs of old, and that he would give the Gentiles hope by giving them the opportunity to be in his family. So, he's not only uh, informing the Gentiles that Jesus came into the world to allow them the opportunity to be in God's family, but he's informing the Jews that this was God's plan all along. 
So I like that Paul one last time is stating his case and making his argument. And then, speaking of his argument, in verse 13, Paul closes this section with what? With a little prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here is Paul coming to the end of his argument, but not in a confrontational mood, not with a shout of triumph, but with a prayer for his readers. That's called magnanimity, folks. Paul prays that God will fill his readers with joy and peace as they trust in Christ. Of course, joy and peace are impossible apart from trust in Christ. And the purpose of his prayer? That his readers would overflow with hope. Hope. That's what we have been given by the God of hope. Well, that concludes Paul's great treatment of justification by faith. Now, Paul will turn to other matters like his reason to, to, for writing the letter, his, his travel plans, and sending greetings to people that he knows in chapter 16. But again, as we close, let's underscore once again the importance of Christian unity. Our Lord's Prayer, what was it in John 17? That by our unity, the world might come to believe that God sent Jesus. It's going to be oh so difficult to reach the lost when they see us Christians so divided and out of harmony with one another. So, what Paul encourages us to do or to pursue in Romans 15 is certainly a valid pursuit. <music>